Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Toby Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Tovia Singer. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you? Hey, great to be here. Doing well. Thank you. Awesome. It's good to have you here always. Always, always cool. Uh, so how was your, how's your week been? I know it's been uh, just a long week for us, I think, here. And then... Um, you asked me earlier if there was any crises here, and I was like, "Well, you know, it's not really a crisis, but depending on the scenario, I guess it could be." Uh, so we have our power pole is right in the middle of our backyard, right? I mean, we have like it's pinned in. Uh, goats are roaming around it, whatever. Point being, the electric company decided it would be a good idea uh, this during this hot summer to go and replace all the telephone poles up and down our stretch. And um, anyway, so it's going to take, it's going to make it to where uh, most of the day tomorrow, we're not going to have any, any electricity at all. So we're going to have to go find somewhere with air conditioning to go hang out, I guess, or, or water, <laughs> something like that. There so, you go. But, uh, but yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Uh, so how have you been doing, sir? Uh, better than you, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> that's Are funny. Any, they're changing any polls here. They're changing some checks, but no polls. The polls are... <laughs> No, it's um, it's just uh, very wonderful to be here in Jerusalem. You know, I just about every night I run uh, to the old city and back, and and visiting the Western Wall last night. Big crowd uh, because there are special prayers now, slichot as we're approaching Rosh Hashanah, which is only uh, weeks away. So it's just a joy. Uh, wow! It's just uh, yeah. Very good, very good. Well, all right. Well, without any further ado, let's go ahead and kick this baby off, and uh, we'll go ahead and take this next caller. Caller, you live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Shalom. This is Stan Embry in Alabama. Welcome. I have a question for mm-hmm. Rabbi Singer. I've sure. always wondered, we know that Daniel was a great prophet, but why, when they put the Hebrew Bible together in the order, the great Sanhedrin and everything, why did they not list Daniel with the prophets? Instead, they listed him with the writings of the prophets. I would appreciate the answer. I've uh, just always wondered about this. Very Thank good. you so much. All right. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. Take care. All right, Rabbi. That's all yours. Well, what a delightful question mm. that is, right and on. it's it's very, it's a very. Um, I like I like this man. I never met him, but he he sounds wonderful. Thank you for the question. So the question is that Daniel was a giant of a prophet. Daniel was such a great prophet that in chapter ten he was standing among other prophets, and there was a a vision to behold, and only Daniel could see. No, the prophets could not so and god called him right there he called him my beloved no no one else in tanakh is called my beloved it was a very high order of a prophet so the question is then why didn't he make it into the section of tanakh called the prophets and for those of you who are not sure what that means so the jewish scriptures is often called tanakh and Tanakh is really an acronym for three major sections. One is the, the Torah, and that's the five books of Moses. And then we have the Nah, the, the Nun part, or the N part. So that stands for the Nevi'im, the prophets. And the last part is called, the third section is called the Ketuvim, or the writings. So people want to know, like, Daniel is in the section of the writings. And the question is, why? He couldn't make it into the prophet section. Why did the Anshe Knesset Agudero, that's the, the men of the great assembly who organized Tanakh and, and really organized the book of Daniel. We did another show on Daniel's authorship a few weeks ago. Why didn't they think he was worthy enough to make it into the prophet section? Wasn't he a prophet? So as it turns out, the section of the prophets is not uh, set aside, is not segregated for those who are prophets, whereas the writings are people who didn't quite make it into the prophet section, so they made it into, like, honorable mention, or they didn't get the gold, but they get the silver. So that's totally not correct at all but rather the divisions are based on what the book is trying to do. 
And in fact, there are many people who authored both Svarim, both books, in the prophet section and in the writing section. Yirmiyo Hanovi, Jeremiah the prophet, a blessed memory. He lived at the very end of the first temple period. He, um, he prophesied for uh, 41 years. From the time he was, he was 15 till he was 56 years old. Could you imagine that? So he authored both Jeremiah and Kings, which are in the prophet section, but he also authored the book of Lamentations, which is in the writing section. So it has nothing to do where your book appears in the in the canon of the Jewish scriptures has nothing to do with the with the with the person's prophethood or his ability to prophesy. That has nothing to do with any of that at all. The book of Ruth was written by the same person who wrote Samuel. It has nothing to do with who who you are, but rather what sort of book is this? What is this safer accomplishing in Tanakh? Now all books of all Tanakh are the word of Hashem. That's number one. All books in Tanakh were inspired by Hashem to the greatest people who ever lived. Those are the prophets who were there was no one as great as them. And they were therefore worthy of receiving prophecy. But their words were also nit nuludaris, which means that their prophecy was given for all generations. What Jeremiah said in his generation was as meaningful then when he preached it as today. A few weeks ago when I was listening to the book of Lamentations called Echa on the ninth day of the fifth month, Tisha B'Av, I heard it and I wept. Just, I'm sure, is the way Jews wept when they heard that Sefer, that book, read the very first time it was heard by others. Those words are eternal, they're forever, because they come from the mind of God, and these prophets wrote what Hashem inspired them to write. So what then is the distinction between the prophets, capital P, and writings, capital W? Because those are the names of sections. Now the five books of Moses, that's the instructions for life, which Moses, Moses our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, all of us show him a blessed memory, recorded exactly what the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, commanded him to write. He wrote whatever he was told. With the exception of the last eight passages of the Torah, that was written by Joshua, his disciple. So the prophets are there as medication to tell you what you're doing wrong. The prophets were essentially oracular prophets especially prophets like Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah. These were oracular prophets. They were, they were providing oracles to the children of Israel, and they were speaking to them, and very often speaking to them with very sharp words. There's, there isn't that much easy reading in the prophetic section of the Jewish scriptures. When I say easy... It's all there like iodine. I remember when I was a kid. So if you hurt your finger, if you injure, you know, you got a cut. So my mother would put iodine on it, and it burnt like crazy. I, used, I, I think they probably still have it. I don't know. But it was very, I, I really gave her a hard time <laughs> when I had to have iodine. But the iodine kept out infections and helped in the healing so it was important. My mom didn't want to hurt me. She wanted to be healthy. But you needed iodine, and it was a it was painful. It was a, it, there was a sharp pain when it was put on an open wound. And that's what the prophets are for. The prophets are speaking to the Jewish people, and they're telling them how to behave. And very frequently, they're admonishing the children of Israel that they're behaving very badly. And they also inform them that you guys have to rise up to be a light to the nations. And the, the, um, the, um, the gap between where you are and where you need to be 
is way too large. How are you going to fulfill your mandate as an or lagoyim, Isaiah 49, 6, if you're acting and behaving in this way? So it's the, the prophets or the works in the prophets section of the Jewish scriptures called the prophets, capital P, okay, uh, is telling the Jewish people to do tshuva and also reminding them of the messianic age. That's why there's so much messianic talk in the prophet part of the Jewish scriptures. And the discussion of Mashiach begins once King David is anointed. That's where you have explicit discussion of Mashiach until the Jewish people select a king. As the Torah, it was in this week's Parsha, at, once the Jewish people uh, choose a king, they don't really choose the king, but they ask for a king. And then the Navi uh, selects one for them. So, oh, you have a pro- you have a king now? Now we can talk about Mashiach. We can talk about what is all coming. Now, my friends, we go to the book of Daniel. As it turns out, in the book of Daniel, there are no oracles where Daniel is speaking to the Jewish people. I know this comes as a shock to all of you who are lovers of Daniel. I I adore the book of Daniel. There is, I can't recall a day offhand in the last month that I didn't read from the book of Daniel. Daniel's way, way, way high up. He's a very great man. He was a great man. I, I don't want to get emotional. He's a very great man. He's a very holy man. You know, he was only 14 years old when he was brought to Babylon. He's a genius. And he was given such a high position in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire, that would go to anybody's head. And then he was installed in the Persian Empire. And his his faith was tested constantly. And he passed all the time. He was a very, very great person. But one thing is absent from the book of Daniel. There are almost no Jews in the book of Daniel. I know that sounds crazy, but aside from his companions, there are really no Jews in the book of Daniel, let alone Daniel talking to Jews. It's very, I don't mean to do this, but I'll do it. People say, oh, the New Testament's all full of Jews. It's Jews talking to Jews, a Jewish audience. There's nothing to do with anything. Question is, is it from God or not? Not if there are a lot of Jewish people in there. You can go to the you go to Wall Street and you can find many Jews. Doesn't mean that the New York Times is a Jewish place because it's all full of Jewish people. So that, listen very carefully. Daniel, the book of Daniel, it's very I, I the first six chapters are very easy to read. If you didn't read the first six chapters of Daniel, there's really there's no excuse because it reads very easily. It's a simple narrative. It was. It's written in the third person by the Great Assembly. And the last six chapters are written by Daniel. It's all in the first person. In the last six chapters, you're going to need a little help because you need to know what these visions mean. They're not difficult. Believe me, it's wonderful. But you, you need someone to hold your hand through that. But the key is Daniel is not sitting there excoriating the Jews. <laughs> Look at Isaiah chapter 1, the opening chapter of Isaiah. What is it? It's a boom. It's like, like what happened there? Whoa, can we ease into this book? Can't you give us a chapter or two of nice talking until we sort of build up? There's no, Isaiah doesn't waste time. Ezekiel, forget about it. If I told you what it says in Ezekiel, unless you read it, you guaranteed you would be shocked at some chapters in Ezekiel where Ezekiel excoriates the Jews in a way that some people are stunned that he would use such language. But right now, take my word for it. Ezekiel is seeking to explain why the first temple had to be destroyed. Jeremiah, oh. Jeremiah is cool per, is, let me translate, is, is all um, castigation, you know, virtually all of it, and messianic talk. So the reason why Daniel is not in the prophet section of the Jewish scriptures is not because Daniel wasn't worthy of it. It's, they're not, it's not like a rating. If you're really good, you got it in the hair. If you're not so good, there. If you're pretty good, there. No, don't think that way. The purpose of the Torah is to instruct you. The purpose of the 
prophets is, that section is, to criticize you and tell you what you could be and what you must rise up to be. And then the writings are telling you, well, how do I do it? What should I do? Should I go to Sedona, Arizona and hum and meditate all day? And uh, I saw that with my eyes. If I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe it. Where they have all these new agers there? No, you're wasting your time. And that's why the prophets, the writings are the last section. You should know the church doesn't like this at all. Why? The church doesn't want the writings section to be the to be the antidote to the problems raised in the prophet section. Now, this didn't happen in the first century. This happens later. We actually see this at the end of the book of Luke. At the end of the book of Luke, it actually lists the order of the Jewish scriptures as the law, the prophets, and psalms or writings. I think it's verse 44. So this later, see, why does a Christian Bible organize the books of the Jewish scriptures differently? Why do they move the writings, many of the writings, before the prophets? Why? You won't believe this. I'm going to tell you now, you wouldn't even believe me. Why would the church tamper with the order of Tanakh? And as I told you, at the end of Luke, it gives us the proper order, and the church will later, and it really the this order is adjusted and adjusted, and in um, the fourth century, we have a major impact on how the church will order the Jewish scriptures. The reason is that they don't like the Jewish order. Why don't they like it? Ah, it's in the Gospels. Big problem. The church does not want the solution to the book of Kings to be the book of Psalms. The church doesn't want that. The church doesn't want that the book of Ecclesiastes should solve the problems raised in Jeremiah doesn't like that at all, not one bit. Why? Because the church wants Calvary to be the antidote. doesn't want uh, the book of Proverbs to be the antidote. So what it does is it switches them around in the Jewish Bible. It means all the books, let's say a Protestant Christian Bible, the, all the Hebrew, the books that the Jew, that's part of the Jewish canon are in a Protestant Bible. The Catholics have much more stuff in there. They have apocryphal works. Forget them. So, but they, the order is not the same. The reason is they want Matthew to be the solution. They don't want the book of Proverbs to be the solution. You get it? The antidote to sin has to be the cross, not the Jewish scriptures. That's why they disorder it. So in short, do not gaze upon the order of the Jewish scriptures as a ranking. It's not at all a ranking. Now, it is true, one caveat here, because I have a smart audience and I'll get, I'll get a lot of messages on this, that because Daniel's prophetic career began in Bavel, in Babylon, rather than in Eretz Yisrael like Yechezko, Daniel receives prophecy through angels. Ezekiel's prophetic career, in contrast, began in the land of Israel. And therefore, God would speak to him directly, whereas Daniel would receive prophecy through angels, as other prophets would as well. So really great question. Daniel is a favorite. But you don't have Daniel speaking to the Jewish people and telling them, thus shall you say, thus shall you not say. You don't even have him talking to Jewish people. It's a completely different type of work. Thank you for your question. All right, very good, very good. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, this is Brian. Hello, Brian. Welcome. So, um, my question uh, to the rabbi, before I present my question, I would kind of like to explain this first. Um, so I recall that there are some videos that the rabbi uh, speaks about uh, Calvinism and the, uh, the five points of tulips and so on, and I recall that the rabbi said um, essentially it's because 
Paul basically needs to um, sell uh, to the to the churches why they can't repent on their own and why they basically need JC. So, um, and one of the points is, is total depravity, which basically uh, denies uh, free will for them. So, what's interesting is that some Christians um, do believe in free will, and I I'm not sure which sex or exactly like how they like formulate their beliefs so um i'm wondering what how do they uh basically present uh why you can't repent on your own or like more essentially for the christians why you need uh jc and, like with the whole idea of free will meaning like you have to choose it because paul says um in truth you can't choose and like he has to choose you there's nothing you can do and, and etc so uh, I wonder if, if the rabbi can uh, teach if like if they have um, if they organize like another idea but based on like with free will just as like uh, like Calvinism like the tulip and um, how even that belief still goes against the Torah if that makes sense. Oh, makes a lot of yes, a great question. But I'm going to need to explain your question. It's absolutely brilliant. Okay, I really waited many okay. years for a question like that. You can go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer. Okay, thank you for your call, Brian. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. Bye bye. All right, bye. Okay. Um, all right. So that was a really good and very sophisticated question, and I want to um, unpack it. So there, there is something called Reformed theology that many Christians embrace. It's the ter- It's called Calvinism, although Calvin did not appreciate that term. And, and, I, and I, I'll explain what it means in a moment. Um, and, but it should be said that many, many Christians really don't believe in it. In fact, the largest Christian denominations don't. Uh, Arminian theology rejects it. The Orthodox Church utterly rejects it. The Catholic Church rejects it. So I, I need to explain what does Reformed theology essentially really mean. And it is, as I've mentioned in previous shows, the natural conclusion of Augustinian theology, which proceeds directly out of Pauline theology. Now, now that you're totally confused, let me explain. Um, Calvinism doesn't just mean that nothing, no effort of your own alone could bring about your own salvation. All Christians believe that. Uh, Paul says so everywhere. Romans 3 is very famous. All Christians need to explain why you need Jesus because the New Testament is spending a really lot of time, and especially, we'll we'll actually leave the Gospels for a moment, and we'll go to the letters of Paul, because the letters of Paul really are the collection of Christian theology. So the, those letters, there's, interesting that the Gospels are so different than the letters of Paul, because the, the Gospels contain the, the alleged history of Jesus, the sayings, the alleged uh, sayings of Jesus and the things he did and said. And there's very little theology in the Gospels. Very little. Conversely, in, the, in Paul's letters, there's, very, there's nothing about what Jesus did in his life. Besides that he died on the cross, but there's nothing describing it. There's, the, there's a description of the resurrection, which which differs significantly from the Gospels' description of an empty tomb. But you have 1 Corinthians 15. But essentially, you don't have sayings of Jesus or activity of Jesus in Paul's letters. Paul's letters are, first, you should know how important I am as Paul. I'm a chief apostle. And it's about, it's about Christian doctrine. There's, now, there are some sayings with Paul says he's quoting what Jesus said and and what he received, 1 Corinthians 11. It's very, very rare. So they're very different, I mean, entirely different types of literature. So really looking to Paul's letters on this. So if man is so completely sinful, 
And there's nothing he can do, no effort that he could um, use, that he can marshal to achieve his own salvation. That's why he needs Jesus to die for his sins. In Christian theology, if you live a life that is completely sinless and you keep the Torah perfectly, you don't need Jesus. That's a, a caveat. But Christians claim that no person can keep the Torah properly. No one can. Ah, what about Abraham? Ah, what about Daniel? Ah, what about Yotam? Ah, what about so, Sneil ben Knaz? What about, there's so many people who did. We don't want to talk about They don't know. It gets very confusing for them. But let's just ride with it instead of presenting contrary. Okay, so that, what I've just said, is what Christians believe. All, I'm going to say lowercase o Christians. That means all Christians, Catholics believe that. You need the blood of Jesus. Without it, you can't go to heaven. Orthodox believe it. The Protestants, they all believe that. Okay? Okay. The, the belief that it makes reform theo- reformed theology so unique is not the total depravity. And again, total depravity in, in TULIP. TULIP is an acronym for the five points of Calvinism. Incidentally, Calvin never heard of those five points of Calvinism because it was only invented about 100 years ago. So it was just a way to remember it. So total depravity is not controversial in the church. Total depravity does not mean what it sounds like. People are just going, bah, and just killing everybody. Total depravity means that is that man is so depraved because of the original sin that he cannot in any way earn his own salvation. That's all it means. There's no work, there's no effort that man could, no initiative of man that could, that could satisfy his salvation. So all, I'm, I'm saying mainstream, meaning all Christians from the Roman Catholic Church to the Orthodox Church to all the evangelical, all the Protestant churches, they all believe that. And that is not controversial. Total depravity. What is controversial of the five points of TULIP is the L, which is limited atonement. Okay? That's the very controversial point. What does this mean? This means that no per it's this is this is like <laughs> this is like christianity but on acid this is like spinning it further what happens if i say to you that actually no person could even choose to believe in jesus and that the atonement of jesus the death on the cross is limited to only those who were elected before they were born All the way in the eternal past, they were elected to be saved. And if they were elected to be saved, then they will find the gospel irresistible and they'll be saved. And if they were not part of the elect, they're going to burn in hell forever. I don't know if that just rests in your your head. So again, of the five points of tulip, uh, total depravity, which is the first, is not controversial as far as Christendom is concerned. It is insane as far as the Torah is concerned. We'll get to that. But the limited atonement is by far the most provoc is the most outrageous part of Calvinism. And I'm going to get into how this all happened. But the limited atonement means the following: that God, before any of you were ever born, decided these Shirley is going to hell, and Bob is going to heaven, and is elect, is saved. And and when Shirley is born as a baby she, and starts to grow up, Shirley could do what she wants. She will never be saved, and Shirley is going to burn in hell forever and ever because God pre-elected, pre-decided to diselect her. It's un- it's un- such a god who would do something like that is a Nazi and should be brought to Nuremberg. They should reopen the Nuremberg gymnasium and they should put such a god on trial because such a god is a psychopath. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that there are people who walk this earth 
who in any other way are completely normal people. I've met people who are Reformed Baptists, and they put on their pants like normal people. And in any other way, they're probably very nice people that I could tell. And they believe something so completely insane. It reminds me of the Mormons, but it's even crazier. Now, again, Arminian theology rejects this. Um, Methodist would, Wesley would have re rejected this. I'm not going to go on and on and on about who rejects Orthodox Christianity can't stand this. Okay, so that's what is Calvinism. That's what is Reformed theology. The Reformed theology is that not only can't you do anything to achieve, earn your own salvation by your own obedience to God, forget that. There's nothing you can do to be saved if you are not pre-selected for the grand lotto of Calvinism to be the elect that Jesus would save. And then Jesus' blood atones for those who are elected. And if you're elected, this, these saints are preserved and they, they can't lose it. And if you are pre-elected to go to hell, you're going to hell. And you can, do, you can walk old ladies across the street from today till tomorrow. And I know you, if, if, you, if you heard of this, you're going, wow. If you've never heard of this, you, you're probably saying to yourself, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. The, you talk about a message that is opposed by the Jewish scriptures, something so grotesque that it really, some, when I teach and people, and I teach systematic theology, People in the audience are sitting there with their jaws hit the floor, and they just can't even believe the Christian that there are, is a significant segment of Christians who would believe such a thing. The prophets of Israel record Hakodesh Baruch, who the Holy One blesses His name, telling us, that "I put life and death before you, good and evil. You must choose life that you might live." Deuteronomy chapter thirty, verse fifteen. In Ezekiel chapter 18, wow, wow, wow. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's really something so beautiful. In chapter 18, verse 23, Imam, they, they should scream this. Do I have any desire in the death of the wicked? Noam Hashem, declares the Lord. Haloi b'shuvoi midrachov is it not rather that he would turn from his sinful ways that he might live? Did you hear that? Did you hear that, all you people in your Reformed churches? Mamish openly says, Hashem is speaking. Is it my? The M is capitalized there, my friends. God is saying, is that, now how could a person who's not heavily sedated, how could any sober person believe that God ascribes to Calvinism, that a psychopath God will go, I'm going to decide before you did a thing if you're going to go to heaven or hell. And and if I decided, do you go there? There are little girls in burning in hell forever. Now, you're probably asking, how could someone even come to believe such a thing? What's behind it? And really, Paul is behind it. But I don't so, and as it turns out, all people who subscribe to Reformed theology all use Paul to demonstrate their beliefs. And they'll specifically use Romans, which shouldn't surprise you, and they'll be using Romans 9 and 10 and other chapters, but famously. Strikingly, that m the, many of the Christians who reject Calvinism. Use the same chapters. It's just a nightmare. It's a nightmare. How could someone believe such a thing? What kind of a sick god of the grotesque? You know, this is like when I was a little boy. So I, I remember I had like G.I. Joes. I had little soldiers. I don't know. I got it for a thing. My aunt gave it to me for a birthday present. So I would go, okay, these are the good soldiers. These are the bad soldiers. I remember playing on the floor with this. It's a very early memory. And the, 
And I decided beforehand that these soldiers are going to all get killed. These are the bad guys and these are the good guys. I mean, is that really what we're to think? That God, um, like we're, you know, Christians, and I'm going to say this about all Christians, they use the language, the exquisite language of Tanakh, words like mercy and love, but it's it the te- the beliefs of the church are utterly devoid of the idea in every way of vicarious atonement means that God is not merciful and someone has to pay the price. Now, where would Calvinism come? Like, how how did you get there? Now, this is where you need to sort of uh, sort of gather around, my friends, and I'll explain to you. You know, when you, I, I learned this when I was a little boy. My father taught this to me, and my father was a student of Ramosha Feinstein, who was a very great sage of the 20th century. And, and that is that, you know, when you move away from the truth, even one degree, so where you make a little change in the Torah, so at the beginning where you move off one degree, there Ah, what is it how, from the point? The different distance is not so far, but as you go out further and further and further and further, the one degree goes far, far apart. Then they're miles apart, many miles, in light years apart. So, and see, so, and the Savera Guerrero Savera, one sin, one sinful teaching leads to much more sinful teachings. Let me explain. With Calvinism, Calvinism, you will be told, is based on the sovereignty of God. Not kidding. If you look up, if you look up in any Christian source of Calvinism, they'll right away tell you that Calvinists ascribe their beliefs to the sovereignty of God. That sounds very attractive. (laughs) Who doesn't believe? What believer doesn't believe in the sovereignty of God? But what they do is, it's all have has been. Uh, bastardized. It, it's something good that has been molested. I'll explain. If you say that man is sinful, Paul completely misquotes passages in the Jewish scriptures in Psalm, uh, in, he quotes Psalm as well, Psalm 14 is one of them, whacked out of context, but he, he just quoting passages all over Romans 3, selecting from different parts, sewing them together. If you just read Romans, you think you're reading, you know, just a stray quote. It isn't, for very good reason. But if you are saying that no one wants the truth, no one, no, not one, a, a grotesque misquote from Psalm 14, that, and that man is totally depraved, meaning that man is essentially a sinful creature, and he can't do anything to achieve his salvation. So here's where we go to the next step of Christian depravity. I'm serious. If you're a Christian, I'm sorry for offending you. Just listen. Okay? But believe me, I have other things to do with my life. I say this with all the love in my heart. So what happens if man is infected so with the original sin? that he can't choose to do something that will bring about his salvation, then how does he choose Jesus? That means that's a really good thing from the Christian viewpoint, from Paul's viewpoint, to choose to believe in Jesus, that Jesus would dwell inside you. What that means, we're not going to get into it, but Christ in you is very big in letters of Paul. I'm not going to get into the... To what exactly that means. Here it's not germane. So if you take the total depravity, which all Christian denominations believe, and you take it to its full logical conclusion, you have now separated yourself from Hashem so far to reject his words that you can do it. I put life and death before you. You can choose good that you might live. And you reject it. So now you're A, going directly to to darkness, you turning your back on Jerusalem, and you turning your face to Athens, to all the wrong places. So if you take the belief that man is so utterly depraved that no initiative of his can bring about his salvation, 
then how could he choose to be a Christian? How could he choose the gospel? How can he choose Jesus? How can he choose the blood of the cross? How can he choose Calvary? How can he choose Golgotha? And therefore, he couldn't possibly choose that either. And therefore, God must have preordained who should go to heaven and who should go to hell. And then Calvinists go to some, there are a number of texts, passages in the Christian Bible where Jesus speaks of the elect of those that the Father gave to him for salvation, as though they're two separate people, although they believe that there's one God. So like God is giving God who should be elected, and there are some passages that are, are taken that way, and they're out of context. I mean, look, I'm not trying... <laughs> I mean, if, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that anyone who would believe in it would have everlasting life and not perish. Our people who subscribe to Arminian theology would argue anyone who would believe in it would have, would not perish but have everlasting life. Like, I'm not here to go and, and, and defend the Methodists. <laughs> it's not my job. It's just a, a mosh pit of, of, grotesque teachings, all of it is in rebellion against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So therefore, the total depravity is only launches the next stage. Calvin was a grotesque person. He was a murderer and he was a thug and he ran Geneva like a police state and burned people alive with whom he disagreed. He was an evil, horrible person, a grotesque person. It was great doctors, Michael Severitus. He was discovered uh, pulmonary circulation, just that the blood is pumped by the heart after it's oxidized by the lungs. He discovered that. He was burnt alive by, by Calvin. You figure it's such a... He was totally depraved. And what they do is they use these nice words, these shiny words... Sovereignty of God. After all, God's in control of everything. But, ha- <laughs> but HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in control of his message. And Hashem says, I gave both to you. I gave good and peace and light, and I gave evil. It's openly in Isaiah 45, verse 7. You must choose life that you might live, Deuteronomy 30. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses, O Mr. Calvin, who's burning in the eternal darkness forever and ever. I call heaven and earth as witnesses. I, I give, uh, before I put life and death, you must choose life that you might live. And you must choose life. So this is the underpinnings of this theology. As I said, Calvinists do scour the Christian Bible to find some verses where Jesus speaks of the elect who have been given to him for salvation. The original New Testament writers would have never thought up something so... Um, so and There's actually a hyper-Calvinism, but I'm not going to get into that. You know, that's where there's no... Because then the question is, like, well, why go out and preach? Like, what's the point? Like, why do you need a great commission in Matthew 28, 19? What, what, if people have been pre programmed to do the right thing, believe in Jesus, or the wrong thing, reject him. And if you are programmed, if you have been selected, if you to go to hell, then you're going to hell and there's nothing you can So why preach? Everyone will come. There are, believe it or not, there are hyper-Calvinists who believe that. There's no point. What's the point? You, you understand what happens, Kindlech? You, you change one, take any perfect system and change one circuit. Just go like this, Jesus. You're going to wind up in all kinds of in craziness. You're going to wind up in Calvinism and Reformed theology. Using nice words like all Christians do. If you're a Christian, don't be offended. Don't. I really, believe me, if I didn't care about you, I have other things to do. Just listen to me. Listen to me. You can't change the Torah. You can't change Tanakh. You want to know the mind of God? Go there. Stop listening to that French Swiss idiot. I, I say it because there are some Christian leaders who I 
I disrespect less than Calvin. <laughs> Sorry, but I had to say it that way so it makes sense. That's where it is. It, the, of the five points of Tulip, it is the limited atonement that is most grotesque and is, to their credit, uh, why uh, non-Calvinists or people who do not subscribe to um, reform theology utterly reject it. But this should also teach you a lesson. And then we'll end with this. Because I can go on. You know me. I can go on. That this shows you how crazy things can get. You just go and go and go. How did you ever get to that? And that's where it goes. So anyways, Hashem should be with you. Now you understand what's going on. But all you have to do is go back and tell you. Why would Hashem say, Echafait, Echpait, Mois Harasho? Why would God say, Is it my desire that the wicked should die. Why would God say that? If he desired it, he's the author of it. But you use fancy words like love and sovereignty, la la la, and suddenly you find yourself on the other, on the opposite end of the world in the darkest places spiritually. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, uh, moving on to the next color. Color. Oh, by the way, callers. Uh, we've I've seen a lot of callers call in. And they're on hold for maybe 30, 45 seconds, and they hang up. Most of these calls, when you do make it in, uh, are going to be on hold for 30, 45 minutes. So just be prepared to hold uh, so that Rabbi can complete uh, his answer to the questions. Okay? So, anyway, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, good morning, William. Uh, good afternoon, Rabbi Singer. Good morning. Uh, this, is Michael per- this is Michael Purdue from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Very good. Welcome. Uh, I have a question about the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 8. Okay, Nehemiah, chapter 8, got it, just for all these. Yes, sir. Uh, where Ezra is reading the, the scroll of the Torah to the people from first light to midday. And uh, I'm wondering what part, is he reading the entire book, you know, the entire Torah from Genesis to Deuteronomy, or is he just reading a portion because six hours is you know, it seems like a pretty short amount of time. So I just wanted right. to get the rabbi's take on that. Okay, so chapter 8 you said, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So this is chapter. very, very famous. This is very famous. And your timing is impeccable because, and thank you for your question. Okay, go ahead and hang up now. Thank Tune you. in for your answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, guys, go ahead. So, the, he was, so first of all, the, your timing is exquisite. Why? Because when did this event happen? It happened on Rosh Hashanah. It happened on the first day of the seventh month. It happened on Rosh Chodesh, the, the new moon of, of the seventh month of Tishrei. So this is really important. So what happens? The people all gather together. And Ezra, who was the, Ezra and Nehemiah, these were giants of people. So the Jews are hearing the law, and they're hearing about the, the Torah of Moshe and how they should live their lives and what the punishments are and so on and so forth. And the people were hearing this, and they begin to cry. They're like just stunned by this. Well, then why would they cry? Would they they never heard of this before? Well, as it turns out, the Jews who were what's called the Shaivavet Sion, they were less than 50,000 Jews who were not the most religious Jews, and they'd been in exile for 70 years. So they've been in, they've been outside of Eretz Israel. They've been outside the land. They've, they've been in a hostile world. Imagine they're listening to the words of the Torah where it tells you about the blessings, about the curses, about all, and they begin to shake and, and they become very, very upset. And they begin to weep. And in fact, then what happens is that, um, is that they are told, go home, stop, go home, eat, drink, because... This is, after all, a festival, Rosh Hashanah, the festival we're going to celebrate very soon, is in fact a day where a person is to be full of joy. 
is supposed to have a beautiful meal. He says, go home, eat your meal, enjoy, and don't get upset because the Torah is there to raise you up, not to condemn you. The Torah is there to show you how to be close to Hashem. And Hashem is very, very merciful. Hashem loves you very, very much. It's really a, a strange chapter. It's so... And it's so um, odd, because here he gets up on the wooden platform and begins to read to them from the Law of Moses, and specifically the Laws of Moses where the Jews need to understand about how to conduct their lives. And the Jews get very, very upset. They take it to heart. And they, the only thing is, on a festival, you're not allowed to become, you're not allowed to mourn, you're not allowed to be sad, you're not allowed to be upset. It's a day of great joy and festivities. And Rosh Hashanah is. And imagine their hearing about the festival of Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, Yom Hadin, where God is judging the world. Imagine how troubled people might be. It's interesting you ask that. And how, how are we to view this day then? Why is this day a happy day? Why would this day of judgment, why would Rosh Hashanah, and literally the word Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year or the beginning of the year, because although um, Nisan is the first month, but the world, Adam was created on Rosh Hashanah. Now you might go, well, that's not, you know, Adam, that's only six days. For right now, just, just know that Adam was created on Rosh Hashanah. And every year, HaKadosh Baruch the Almighty revisits the world that he created. There are many people who are married, and if you ask confidentially the wife, let me ask you a question. Between you and me, if you can do it all over again, and you're about to go out on the first date with your husband, with your future, would you have married him again? No kids, nothing. You can. Would you marry that girl if you could do it all over again? So not every person would say that they would marry the same person again. Now they're kids. Now it's complicated. Now I make the best of it. But if you ask someone, if you can go back in time, would you have would you have married that man? A lot of people might not be so quick to say yes. But Hashem's relationship is one of a father. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu revisits mankind each year. He looks at it and says, I would do it all over again. If I could do it over again, I would do it over again. Let's have a festivity. Yes, there are many corrections to be made. It's, it's good that it comes up here in um, Nehemiah because here the second temple is being built and the second commonwealth of the Jewish people is being launched. And we have a nation that survived, the promise fulfilled, the nation returned from exile. The people are alive. The nation of Israel lives. Am Yisrael Chai. There are a lot of problems with you boys. And I want to correct you. I want you to make you better. That's why the Torah is there. But I want you to know this. If I can do it again, I would have created you all over again. If I can do it all over with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the way I'm going. That's what Hashem says. And that's why Rosh Hashanah is not a day where we walk around crying. We walk around in a state that resembles any morning at all. Today, in fact, if you look carefully at the liturgy of the Rosh Hashanah prayer, it would be very hard to find anything that mentions uh, atonement, sin, very, it would be almost impossible to find that. But rather it's a day of remembrance, a day of shofar, a day of coronation, a day of the king, 
where we say, when we declare that Hashem is our king. But don't be afraid of him as you'd be afraid of a king of Bosa Vedom. Don't worry. If he can do it again, he sure would. He would do the whole thing all over again. Does that mean that we don't have any work to do on our relationship? We do. We have to raise ourselves up higher and higher. But if you start crying on Rosh Hashanah, it's forbidden. Go home. Enjoy. Be festive. Don't start weeping. So that's the message of Nehemiah chapter 8. It's really beautiful, and it's amazing that you would choose a time now when we're only exactly a month away, and one month we'll be celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not a day, uh, it's not a day of sin and atonement. It's, and incidentally, that's why Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur follows Rosh Hashanah. Logically, if he's going before the king, so logically, first you should atone for your sins and repent and fix yourself up and mournfully... Uh, you're not supposed to mourn on Yom Kippur, but you're supposed to contritely, and with great contrition, repent for your sins, be aware of it, confess your sins, return to Hashem. So you really should be doing that sort of activity before you go to stand before God and coronate him as God. First, get yourself in shape. No. The first thing you got to do is you got to recognize who's the judge, who's the king. When the judge walks into the courtroom, before any proceedings take place, everyone stands up. Please rise. Here's the judge. The first thing you have to do before you can even start to approach Yom Kippur is you have to say, that's my king. He's the king of kings. He's lord of lords. And I blow the trumpet as a coronation of him. And, of course, the trumpet reminds us of the shofar of the ram's horn of Abraham. And it wakes us up. Wake up, you sleepyheads. Arise, it's time. And that launches a 10-day period from Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month, to Yom Kippur, the 10th day of the seventh month of repentance. It's called Aseris Yimei Hachuvo which culminates in Yom Kippur. Thank you for that question. Ah, very interesting answers, for sure. Okay, well, caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Caller, you're live on the air. Can you hear us? Hello, hello? Just making sure you can hear me. I can hear you now. You're live. What's going on? All right, yes. My name's Ozzy. I'm, I'm calling in from Georgia. Welcome, Ozzy. How are you? And I'm... Uh... <laughs> And uh, basically, my question is, uh, how how would how would a uh, how would the rabbi Tovia Singer, by the way, how how are you, rabbi? How would you how would you respond um, to Maxwell? Wait, uh, wait, wait! Yes, me a question. <laughs> yes, me how I'm doing. So first, I'm doing very well. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, wait sir. for the answer. Go ahead. How would you respond to Jordan Maxwell's outrageous claim that uh, that Judaism is a uh, is somehow uh, some sort of uh, Saturn worship because uh, because uh, because of the Sabbath and that uh, and that there's no proof basically for Abraham Isaac and Jacob. I feel like this is an outrageous claim. I just want to know. Uh, I just want to kind of. I, huh. I want to kind of debunk his his statement. What's his name? What's his uh, name? He, so basically, he says that he's ba he, basically he's saying that uh, who is he? Solomon who is and this David, person? Oh, Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell. I've heard him. Okay. Anyway, so he said there's no such person as Abraham Isaac and Jacob. These are my grandparents, okay? <laughs> so, like, and, and what basis? I mean, I'm a descendant of these people. These are my great grandparents. So, he, so he, he's saying, I, wait, he, I don't he, exist. Exactly. So, so he's saying that he spoke to a rabbi and that the rabbi said that this is, that this is just a myth. That is meant to be. It's meant to be have a deeper me meaning. So I just want to oh. kind of debunk that. Oh, and so uh, Mr. I understand. I got. I got your question. Thank you. Okay, I'll say, thank you so much for your call. Go ahead and hang up now. You tune in for the answer. Okay. Yeah. So he basically so he's saying that it's some kind of astrotheism or astrology, and I just want to debunk that. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, uh, Rabbi. Have a great day. Perfect. Thanks. Bye bye. Go ahead. So I, you know, it's like I, maybe you know Bill Clinton is an alien. I I don't even know how do you how how do you he went to a rabbi, and the rabbi says, "There are 
people who are call themselves rabbis who who are not not only not rabbis, they're enemies of the Torah. I don't know that he went like he went to this rabbi and he and he ignored every other rabbi. You know, they have they had a they had a, an M a guy with an MD. I think I don't remember his name. But you know, there's this whole thing with the measles vaccine. It's not big now because everyone's concerned with the coronavirus. But it was like a big deal before the coronavirus pandemic broke out. There was this one MD who said that uh, people shouldn't get the measles vaccine. You know, you find one, a yo-yo who, who, who actually may have the training but says something that's completely theirs. You want, you could scour all the people and you'll find some yo-yo who believes something and you could just, but it's in, it's not possible. This person said, I don't know what to believe. And he chose some fake rabbi, nobody be insulted, who just believes in this minimalist, extreme, you know, there are people who have the title rabbi who believe that aliens came down on Mount Sinai. What am I supposed to do with that? I mean, what, what am I supposed to do? I don't even know how to answer this question. I, I am a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I myself am. And the tri- and Levi. And Kahos. I'm a descendant of Aaron. This is my, this is my grandpa. And the women they married are the grandmothers. And this is the birth of a great nation. And you see that Hashem kept his promise. The nation is here. Hashem made a promise to Abraham that I'll make your children like the stars of the sky, that they can't be numbered. What do you mean like the stars of the sky? There's so many stars. There's not that many Jews in the world. There's not that many people in the world. The the modifiers, they can't be numbered. Eternal. If something can't be numbered, that means it's, it's, it's not in Teva. It's not in nature. It's outside of nature. Everything could be numbered. The sands of the beaches, they, there is a number. I don't recall its number. There's an estimate to how many how many um, grains of sand there are in the world. Whatever it is. But it could be numbered. You take a cup of water. Take this glass of water right here. So, there are how many water molecules are there in this glass? I don't know the number. But I'll tell you this, there are more water molecules in this glass of water than there are cups of water in all the seas and the oceans. Do you hear that? In this glass of water, there are more water molecules than there are cups of water in all the Earth's oceans and seas. All the water... But it can be numbered. It can be. The Jewish people are lemaylem in ateva. They're above nature. Look at the stu- look at the sun. If you're, if it's daylight for you right now, do you see the sun? If it's at night, do you see the stars, the moon and the stars? If those laws shall pass. Can the depths of the earth be measured? If those laws shall pass, so will the seed of Jacob pass before me, being a nation. That's why the Jews are a witness people. Maybe, maybe anything. Maybe. Kindler. But the nation bear testimony to Hashem's existence. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. Lamante du Sishnovasaminuli should believe in me. You should understand before me no God was formed, neither is there one after me. The Jews are a witness people. That's why that the Jews in the Torah are one. It means that we testify to the to the Torah, and the Torah testifies to us. And it's true that the uh, the proof of Abraham, we have a whole nation. We have all the promises fulfilled. If I tell you what the market is going to do tomorrow and it does it, so go lucky guess. 
And if I tell you the next day what it's going to do, and you're going to look, yes, but eventually you're going to figure out that I have insider trading information. Eventually, it, it, and if I tell you that while Obama now supports Joseph Biden's Joseph Biden's uh, presidential aspirations now. But next week, he's going to change his mind because Obama is going to announce that he is becoming a Lubavitcher and converting to Judaism. And, and if that happens, you go, there's no way you can guess that. Either you have very inside information or you have an amazing source, but there's, it's almost inconceivable. Such a thing would be You'd have to have inside information. And the nation is here. We're a living, breathing testimony of God. That's why the Jews were giving Shabbos. Baini Huvain Bene Yisroel. I see Leah. I love that Shabbos is between me and Israel. It's an eternal covenant forever. It's a testimony to the nation. So, my friends, you have people who are just repeating. There is, there is in the academia, our good friends, I don't know what we would do without them. So they have the, this, this minimalist view that nothing nothing was, nothing. They, they, they have views that are so insane that the whole tire was written 25 minutes ago. You know, they're stuck with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm not kidding. They're stuck with the Dead Sea Scrolls that are, the oldest scrolls are, let's say, 2,200 years old. They say, yeah, the Torah was written then. Yeah, there are many then. No, it wasn't written then. It was maybe written 2,500 years ago in the time of Ezra. Well, it wasn't written then. It was written during the time of Yeshio, Josiah. No, it wasn't written then. It was written during the time of Hezekiah. You know, they're trying to minimalize any truth in Tanakh. I don't know this man, and this man doesn't need to know me, but he does need to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he needs to know him very fast. But this is just silly talk. We're a nation. We're a breathing nation. You could literally take a, get a package in the mail, swab the, take out a, like a Q-tip, whatever it is, swab the inside of your cheek, Mail it in, and they'll tell you where you come from, how your family connects to the Jewish people, going back, direst and direst, generation, generation, generation. We do that. We do that today. We know that. Kaihanim, priests. So the discovery was done. The University of New Mexico. The priests were the sons of Aaron, which means we're ben achaben, son after son from Aaron directly. I am in my family. Father, 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 Aaron, the high priest. How stupid to say Abraham is as well. Aaron was born of a, of a virgin. How stupid. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. So they, they wanted to know. That, I mean, that means if there are, I don't know the number, but let's say there are half a million priests in the world today. Like myself. We're just direct sons of Aaron. I don't know that that number is correct. I just just pull that number. So we all, if we all come from the same uh, great grandfather, then there should be an identifying feature on our Y chromosome, which is conveyed by the father, not by the mother. And guess what? Once again, the tire prevails. Once again, the faith of, the, of Judaism, of the Jewish people, prevails. And they found that, in fact, that, that Kohanim, that priests, have a, a marker on the Y chromosome that's completely unique. What a big coincidence. Once again, all the enemies of the Torah are all proven wrong again. And they walk away. But they don't put their heads down. They go on to the next. They find their next victim. All right, we, we try to prove that King David, they say King David didn't exist. King David lived many generations after Abraham. Right? And they used to say, there's no King David. It's a complete myth, a fake phony. This is what they always said. Imagine such a thing. 
And then they found all kinds of sources, archaeological sources, Teldan and so on, which were written by others, not by Jews. It was written by in 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 Assyrian, in an I believe in a, an Akkadian language, one of all kinds of Semitic languages from kings who boasted about victories they had over David or David's house at that time, twenty nine hundred years ago, and then all the phonies from all these universities, they dropped it. They went on to the next ridiculous claim. So this is all silliness. I don't know who he is. Whoever you are, don't try to hunt me down. I don't know you from a hole in the wall, but this is all nonsensical. And I don't know if this person's a doctor, but there's a lot of these guys who have PhDs in, um, at the end of their names and a doctor in front of their name. And that's also dangerous. It's dangerous to give people who have doctorates and who have PhDs people who get to the terminal level of academic study of the Bible to call them a doctor because you're saying, you're calling him a doctor and you're, talk, you're calling the anesthesiologist who puts propofol on you and then keeps you alive for hours while you're in surgery and that guy really has to know. He can't be guessing. And you're calling them both the same name, same title, doctor. People think that it must be that a doctor of whatever, of ancient, whatever, he has the same certainty of what he's saying as an anesthesiologist has of what he's saying, and believe me, they're not. No one of you atheists, no one of you deniers would want to go under the knife with a surgeon and an anesthesiologist who has the same certainty as the minimalist archaeologists and historians with also a doctor in front of the name. That you wouldn't do. I said enough. Let's move on. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to mention on. <clears throat> pardon me, something else. Almost choked on my coffee here. <laughs> All right, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you're calling from? I actually call her just hung up. All right, no worries. Well, folks, if you don't have them probably, already, probably an archaeologist. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of uh, interesting comments that pop up on uh, pop up on YouTube uh, on the YouTube chat. I try not to read it because there's plenty of other readers out there who can take care of that for us. But uh, anyway, so. Phone lines are open, 855-952-4253. The last caller just hung up. Uh, so let me put that number back on your screen just in case. Uh, if you guys don't have it, go to outreachjudaism.org, two-volume book set, and the audio files are, you can look at them there. If you've never uh, used his audio resources to go with the books, uh, you you really are missing out. So um, I don't know how, how else to explain it other than um, that's not, it's not an audio book on on the audio files. It's it's actual added just additional research, additional information that's not on the pages. So it's really really awesome. Uh, again, outreachjudaism.org is the best place to buy those. You can find them on Amazon, but personally, I'd probably recommend you to get them off of his website. I think uh, for I don't know if that's good advice. Maybe I don't know what you think, Rabbi. I I want to just say yes. You can certainly come to outreachjudaism.org, and I strongly recommend you. Download free, completely free, 24 audio programs. Let me just, I want to just tell, I never said this, tell you what these are. It's so nice that I'm not selling something. Listen, I lectured in Dallas, Texas for whatever it was for, I don't know, half a year. I, I flew to Dallas and the audience, maybe there were 500 people at the Jewish Community Center in Dallas. This place is packed. And I'm sure that the majority of them were Christians in the audience, at least when we started the series. But there, there's a physician in Dallas that sponsored that. He said, Rabbi, would you willing to come to Dallas? I'll put you on a plane each week. And that's what I would do. And it was, I think it was every um, Tuesday night or Wednesday night, it's going back quite a number of years ago. And I was like, wow, we can reach people in Dallas. It would be amazing. And a lot, a lot of Christians showed up at the beginning. By the end, many of those Christians repented. They chose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Many, 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 many converted to the Jewish faith. Many of them are today great rabbis here in the land of Israel, great giants of Torah here in Israel. 
And those audio programs, whether it's Sin Atonement, the Trinity, Isaiah 83, were done in front of a live audience. And it's funny for me, I have to say just this, I don't think I ever said this. So imagine a huge crowd, a good five, six, there was a standing room only. The place was packed. But it's funny that the people who were there, there were a lot of B'nai Noach there, but they're just these were people from the South. <laughs> so, like, if I were lecturing in New York, you don't, you wouldn't have routinely hear people in the audience go praise the Lord. <laughs> but there you do. You have all these people praise the Lord, Rabbi, and it was like, wow, they do that here. And you know, I guess that's what it's like in the South. But it was, it was a very, very special series. There's no charge. You just download the audios. We used to have them on CDs, but it became CDs also. And it was just too expensive to publish. I just give it away for free. Let people have it. It was too much. So it's there. Download them. It's a, those are all live programs where I explore the deepest issues that separate the faith of Israel from the church and why Judaism does not accept the Christian Messiah, but we do revere the God of Israel. I encourage you to go to OutreachJudaism.org and you can download them there and study them there. And I would encourage you that, <laughs> thank you, Rabbi, for that. Uh, you know, I can go, anybody can go there now, just download them one at a time, but you can, there's a link, I think a special link there that if you, you can make a donation of any amount and everything will go to help Rabbi and his, his mission here. Uh, to a little donation of any amount, you can download the entire set all at once, but they're fantastic to have. I still have them on my phone today and listen to them quite frequently. So, uh, all right, let's go ahead and take this next color. Color, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello. So, um, there is a, a move, I don't know, I don't know if I would call it a movement. Oh, uh, what right? is your name? There, um, Who are we speaking with? Uh, Brian, it's Brian. Brian, welcome, okay. Uh, so, there are, um, some Christians, and maybe, uh, this, like, idea would also be adopted by the, the Messianics, that, um, they really hold on to the teachings of, of J.C. rather than of Paul. Um, and like I heard some Christians say that, oh no, but Paul contradicts JC and this and that and, and a bunch of other things. And um, interestingly enough, last week's parasha, parasha Shoftim, talks about a prophet that speaks in the name of Hashem, yet um, he actually isn't saying what Hashem told him to say. Or like if he says something and it doesn't come true, then not to fear him. Mm-hmm. So basically, my question would be um, are there any explicit teachings or alleged teachings of course that jc taught that were against the torah um (laughs) that would i guess already like help because paul you can there's countless things that he says that are against the torah but uh people really like to hold on to jc and that's like that's the main figure and um especially since um if jc was able to say something for example uh uh, I think uh, I heard that uh, some prophets were able to, I guess, temporarily like withhold or like pause a mitzvah. And uh, an example was uh, Elijah on Mount, on Mount Carmel, um, because uh, normally he wouldn't be able to do that. So I guess um, maybe JC was allowed, I guess, to say certain things against the Torah that were temporary. But I, I, this is just my point. So uh, if the rabbi can right. just touch up on, on yeah. that subject. <laughs> Okay, Brian, go ahead and hang up now, and you continue for your answer, okay? Thank you for your call. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, bye. And timing-wise, uh, Rabbi, how are you doing on timing? Well, we'll take this as our last question. Okay, very good. All right. Go with Rabbi. This is a tricky question. I, I, I kind of wasn't sure where you were going to go with this, Brian, and I was following you on this path. Uh, it's interesting, first, that there is an iteration of the Messianic movement, which is Christianity, but with Jewish symbols, icons, and traditions. But there is, from the Messianic movement, there are there are so many sects, and they're killing each other. There's so many fights between one Messianic group and another group, they're all putting each other in, excommunicating each other. So as it turns out, there are some Messianic groups today that are emerging, and I've met some of these guys, who don't believe in Paul at all. And they believe that Paul was a heretic, kind of like the Ebionite movement or like the Nazarene movement. 
that were told about from in the writings of the church fathers. I met these people. They, to them, Paul's a complete heretic, but they believe in in the Gospels. Um, so I thought that was what you you were going to ask about. So that there is these. Are, I don't know how large these numbers are, but they're there. Um, but you're asking, did, did Jesus himself teach anything that's against the Torah? There's a really big problem here. The really big problem here is that what did Jesus teach that's against the Torah? Now, I would just caution you as a caveat to not say JC. It's better to just say Jesus. It's better not say any of it because the Torah says, well, you shall it shouldn't be heard on your mouth. But if you're going to say anything, say Jesus. But to say JC is really an acronym for Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus the Messiah. So you're kind of saying what you don't want to say. So a lot of people say JC, and it's really a good idea not to. Because that's pretty much the worst thing you could say. Um, so th the problem is that I don't believe that that Jesus said these things. Well, I can't say he didn't say anything in the Gospels, but I, I just, um, I, I, the problem is that the Gospels are very late. They're written 40 years after when Christians uh, believe um, that Jesus was crucified to, eight, to from 60 years, from 70, which is 40 years later, to 65 years later for the book of John. So there's so much mythology and overlay and overlay. Can anything be said uh, in, can anything in the Christian Bible in any way accurately reflect what Jesus might have said? And I don't believe that. I think the, so therefore I'm sort of stuck and I, I don't want to make up stuff because that's what I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against people who've made up an entire religion. I, he, I could more accurately say what he didn't say than what he said. Jesus definitely did not walk around saying he's the Messiah. That definitely was a later invention. And after he died, people thought that he was the Messiah, and the Messiah is supposed to die for mankind. He didn't walk around... It, I can't say for sure, but it's incredibly unlikely. Why? Because if we go back to the to the Synoptic Gospels and even go further, go to the to the foundation of the Synoptic Gospels, Mark. Well, Mark is only sixteen chapters, only six hundred and seventy-eight verses. The first eight chapters, Jesus doesn't tell anybody who he is. Why not? And he's certainly not walking around going, I'm this and I'm that, and I'm the bread of life, and I'm, I'm the vine, and I'm the way that you... He didn't do any of that. He didn't, not only that, if somebody was chayshish, anyone suspected that he might be the Messiah, shh, don't tell anybody. So the, the more likely thing is that he never made any of those claims. How? But, so it's unlikely that the author of Mark would have invented the idea that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah when he really did claim to be the Messiah. That would not make sense. It would make a lot of sense for Christians to later claim that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah when, in fact, he didn't. I mean, there's always a reason for Christians to high, heighten the Christology, not to lower it. So... So therefore, this is so this is not a true answer. Yes, if Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life, no one can come to the Father but by me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So then he would have been a, a very wicked man. I hope for Jesus' sake, for his sake, that he never said such filth out of his mouth. I hope so. I can't know if he said it I'm straight away. But I, our tradition is that Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, but that claim was made for him. And that would fit well with the Gospels, where Jesus, right before he's crucified, after a one-year 
as in the synoptics, or a three-year ministry, as in John, Jesus turns to the people who are around them all the time and asks them, who do you say that I am? And they don't know. And then when Peter says in Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says that flesh and blood did not, could not have revealed that to you. Well, what do you mean? Didn't Jesus walk around telling everybody that he's the Messiah? Do you understand what's going on? Now, why, how the heck did that ever wind up in the Christian canon? So there could be only one explanation, is to explain away a problem that early Christians had. And that is that from what we've heard, because it began with oral stuff, there's all these fake religions. People say, but he, the guy, no, nah, I was told the guy never claimed it. He was like, oh, yeah, it was the biggest secret in the world. As I said, to read the book of Mark, how long would it take? It wouldn't take you two hours. If you read the book of Mark, it would, really would not take a long time. And that's and, and the reason why people don't notice this is that everybody who's read the book of Mark read the book of Matthew first. This is the biggest nightmare. This is what made Augustine a genius, a, a, a demonic genius, to order Matthew first. Because if people would read Mark first before ever have read, read Matthew, they would be astonished. When they, when they got to Matthew, they go, well, how did the virgin birth get there? But they would be astonished that, that Jesus is just, it's the biggest secret in the world, who he is. And I find that the most intriguing part of Mark. I mean, Mark is interesting because there's less layers of mythology. And it's still a... a load of it, and I can go through with you and show you how the narrator of Mark is infusing stuff. There was clearly an earlier um, oral tradition or text that just didn't survive. Very likely a text. And they could show it to you, but I'm not doing it now because we'll be going too far away. Um, all New Testament scholars would agree with this. Um, so, so therefore, it would if you read Mark and never had read, read Matthew, that never happens because every person reading a New Testament logically just goes to the first gospel, which is Matthew, but it's out of chronological order. And therefore, when you get to Mark, having finished Matthew, because the synoptic, synoptic, what does that word mean? It's two Greek words with the same view. They're very similar, the first three gospels. That's why they're called synoptic gospels. They're not, they're really, there are little, quite striking differences between them. But there's a structure, there's, you know, there's a lot of similarities between them. There's a lot, a lot of similarities between them. So if, you re, if your mind is colored with Matthew, so then when you get to Mark, which is absent of so many colors, you just insert what you think must be there I've spoken to Christians who didn't know that there's no infancy narrative in the book of Mark. And they go, what? I, I didn't know that. Jesus is not baptized in the book of John. What? They just, you know, they, they just assume he must have been baptized like we have in the synoptic gospels because it's all colored. They're all, the stories are colored from the previous book. It's brilliantly done to put Matthew first. It's evil, but brilliant. It's diabolic. So, what did Jesus? I can go a list of what Jesus said, grotesque things that he said, of, of heightening his own importance. But I don't for a minute believe that Jesus walked around saying any ridiculous things. And these were put in later. And even the first, the synoptic gospels didn't think that Jesus walked around saying any of those things because it would be inconceivable. You would have to lose your mind to believe that Matthew just didn't think that Jesus' I am's were important enough to mention. The I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was I am, John 8, 58. It's just not conceivable. So, um, so therefore, it's a, a big mosh pit of shekev, of, of lies and, and deceit. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I can't believe what I just said. I'm not trying to be offensive, but it's just layers of mythology one on top of the other. And Christian 
Christians are good people. A lot of them are, not all, but a lot of them are good people. But just you grow up and you, your grandmother tells you Jesus loves you and that's how you go to bed at night. You believe this stuff. Christians have to get to Tanakh, start reading the Jewish scriptures. And then when they go to the New Testament, they'll go, whoa, there's no relationship between the two. I can't, I don't know that Jesus really said that what enters your mouth doesn't defile you. Only what goes into, what comes out of your mouth doesn't defile you. Excuse me, what goes into your mouth doesn't defile you. What goes out of your mouth doesn't defile you. And therefore, the narrator goes on in Mark 7, and therefore making all foods clean. So it's very clear that the narrator put that word, that therefore in. Right? He inserted that on top of some previous text. But, but I, I'm not going to sit here honestly on air and go tell you, I think Jesus said that. Could have, but it would violate the verisimilitude that we would ordinarily use as a measuring stick to know what is likely to have occurred. Verisimilitude. You can hear the two Latin words. Something that is would match in some way a Pharisaic world. It would make sense that he would that anyone in the coming emerging from the Pharisaic world would say something so stupid like that. Uh, it would certainly go would be fabulous for all the pork eaters later for the Greeks. When I say Greeks, I mean Gentiles in a sense. For them, they'll be very happy as could be that they can eat all these, do all these things, and it's not a problem. I mean, this is not complicated, but I, I honestly, I can't tell you. Paul is a whole different book. Paul, I can tell you exactly what he thought and meant. I know exactly every second what Paul thought. I know exactly what, I, I, and I know how tormented he was. I know things about him most people don't understand about him because I can read his writings. Jesus didn't write anything except for something in the sand, but that's even a fake. <laughs> I know I'm gone. But Paul's letters are really from the hand of Paul, especially seven of them. So I really can get a, a very uh, good snapshot of Paul. And it, and he's very consistent in, a, in an unpleasant way. And one of the true enemies of God, really, really one of the despicable people in history who did so much damage to the world. One person did so much damage. So. Um, anyways, thank you very much for your question. Shalom, William. Yes, sir. Shalom to you as well. Uh, it's been a great show as usual. Uh, and you guys, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications. And uh, once again, uh, Rabbi, it's always a pleasure having you here. Look forward to each show. Always each week, a so. big pleasure. Without this show, <laughs> forget about it. But thank God you have me. You're okay. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Same time, same place, as Shem Willing. Um, till then, uh, remember, uh, no shows tomorrow because our electricity is going to be down for most of the day. Uh, if they get finished up soon enough, I'll let you guys know if we have a show coming after all. Okay, so thank you guys and have a good one. Take care. Peace. Shoo, we're here, 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 we're here